Welcome to the New Books Network. When I marched in Selma, I felt my legs were praying. Those were the words of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marched for civil rights in 1965 alongside Martin Luther King, Jr. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Renee Garfinkel, your host on the New Books Network with the Van Leer Jerusalem series on ideas. I'm pleased to welcome Julian Seltzer to the show today to talk about his new book, Abraham Joshua Heschel, A Life of Radical Amazement. Julian E. Zelizer is a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University. In addition to his prolific scholarship, he's a frequent commentator in television, radio, and print on contemporary politics, including his weekly column on CNN.com. Julian Zelizer, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. And Julian, you're both a scholar and a public intellectual. Who or what were some of the strongest influences on your own intellectual development? Well, uh, first, uh, it's it's wonderful to have this conversation. There's a number of people who influenced me. Obviously, within my family, uh, there were many people who had a big effect uh, on my life. My grandfather, Nathan Zelizer, on my father's side, was a rabbi in Columbus, Ohio, and then in South Florida. After he retired, he kept starting synagogues. And he was a very uh, charismatic and influential leader in the Jewish community, a terrific speaker, um, and someone who was not just a rabbi, but deeply involved in all sorts of civic activities in the cities he lived. And he was a big influence. My father, who was also a rabbi, Jerry Zelizer in uh, Metuchen, New Jersey, a conservative rabbi, and my mother, Viviana Zelizer, who was a professor of sociology, still is. Uh, all of them, all of my family, I think, played a part, of course, uh, in shaping who I was. And, and then there were writers who influenced me along the way. One who was particularly influential to me is Richard Hofstetter, who is a historian at Columbia, uh, one of the great historians of the 1950s and 60s, and, and tried to bridge the world of the academy and public life and uh, see where the point of connection was uh, between the two. And, and his writing, which was provocative, it was bold, it was big ideas, uh, remains a, a big influence. Um, I can keep going with many people, but those are some that instantly come to mind. Well, then my next question is almost answered, which was, why did you choose Heschel since none of your other books, as far as I could see, focused on uh, theologians or religious leaders? But why right. did you well, choose him at this point? What's a, what's a political historian like me doing writing <laughs> about a theologian? Uh, there, were, there were actually a, a couple of reasons. One is, yes, of course, I, I am an observant Jew and uh, my Judaism has always been as defining for sure as my academic life. And that comes not just from my own practice, but from my family background as, as a rabbinic kid and grandkid. And so Heschel was someone who I was familiar with, who uh, I had read or heard the quotes that we often hear in services and seen the pictures uh, from Selma and some of the marches against the Vietnam War. And so uh, when this opportunity arose and the series that it's in asked me and wanted to pair me with this figure, I jumped at the opportunity. I also, I've written a lot about the 1960s and uh, I wrote a couple books ago. Uh, uh, it's called The Fierce Urgency of Now. It was a book about Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. And it covered many themes, but one of the stories that really emerged in the book was the role of religious organizations and leaders in the civil rights movement, uh, both black preachers like Martin Luther King and others who were really central as organizers, and then other religious groups, including many Jewish groups, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, uh, and other uh, faith groups that played a big role in mobilizing support. And I, I was intrigued by this. I moved on to other issues, but it's one of those stories that stuck in my head. Uh, and Heschel was just a perfect way uh, to get to get back into that. And, and here, you know, uh, finally, in, in the United States, there are ongoing questions always and debates about how to preserve uh, Jewish identity and how to uh, revitalize the Jewish community. I've seen this uh, firsthand. I followed this. And so 
Heschel's writing was actually really interesting and instructive as a way into questions that I think are very much on the minds of the Jewish community in 2021. Well, for those of our listeners who are not as familiar with Heschel, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about his background. He was European, uh, born, raised, uh, educated, both Eastern European and Western. We'll get to that. Uh, and came to the United States, like so many others, uh, to escape the Holocaust. Now, his background was a uh, Hasidic. And to outsiders, all Hasidism may seem the same. They all dress in black and uh, uh, live separately and seem to spend more time uh, dancing than uh, non-Hasidic Jews. But the young Heschel was influenced by two very different Hasidic worldviews and personalities. The Baal Shem Tov, on the one hand, known for his upbeat, optimistic, lighthearted view of spirituality, and the Kutzka Rebbe on the other side, who was known for his darkness and his pessimism. Tell us about who they were and the differences between them and what impact you think that made on Heschel. Yeah, these were uh, two very different traditions. And when he was a young boy, uh, he was being trained by his father, who was also a rabbi, to be a rabbi. And his father focused more on that tradition of, of the Baal Shem Tov and uh, stories and uh, lessons about the goodness of human beings, about the need to be kind to others, about the tzaddik, uh, who was a, a person who could elevate the entire community uh, and bring us closer to God, uh, and a, a certain um, kind of a positive outlook about the possibilities of the world combined with exuberant prayer uh, and and a, a kind of davening, a praying that involved mind, body, and spirit. And, and this was really the tradition he was being trained in. Um, his father dies in 1916 um, of influenza, actually, uh, that uh, was an outbreak taking place all over the world. Uh, and his uncle, Heschel's uncle, who's also a rabbi, takes over his rabbinic training. Uh, and he, along with another rabbi who's brought in, emphasizes this other tradition, uh, the Kotzker tradition. And this was a much darker and bleaker outlook uh, about human beings, uh, kind of seeing a certain level of evil that was almost instinctive and inevitable. Uh, and it wasn't the same kind of spirit that he had learned uh, from his father. And, and in many ways, these two worldviews uh, were at odds. And Heschel would spend a lot of his life, I think, uh, not rectifying how the two went together, but wrestling. How could both be true? How could both be part of the human condition? Uh, and how can both be part uh, of how Jewish theology uh, looks at the world. And it was at the very end of his life, uh, he publishes a book uh, called The Passion for Truth, where he tries to show how the two could go together and how the two were not totally uh, diametrically opposed. So this is uh, intellectually, theologically, the, the roots of what he was learning as a young boy. And when he got older, he uh, went to university in Weimar, Berlin, which also had a profound impact on both his intellectual and his spiritual growth. Tell yeah, us about it, that. I mean, it's a fascinating story. And, and I would just say before he gets to Berlin, he is in a Hasidic community and, and he's in the uh, Jewish part of, of the city, which is very large. It, it was a, a huge part of the population. There are all kinds of Jewish communities there from Hasidim to, you know, Zionists to radical labor organizers and socialists and poets and publishers. And Heschel was always, even though he was a Hasid and being trained as a rabbi, he was always really interested in these other worlds. Uh, even as a teenager, he starts to write poetry for a journal at, at an institute in Warsaw that was run um, by 
uh, non-religious uh, poets and playwrights. And he decides it's a big decision. He wants to go to the get a PhD to get a doctorate. So he goes to Berlin uh, and he studies for a PhD in philosophy. And those are really uh, quite important years. This is in the 1930s. He is watching uh, the rise of Nazism, and uh, he's very frightened and angry about what's going on. He expresses ongoing frustration that the Christian community is not doing enough to stop um, the, the rise of this uh, vicious totalitarian force. He's also, though, intellectually very engaged and satisfied. He loves the university. He loves talking philosophy with some of the greatest thinkers in the world. He's also involved outside the university in all these different intellectual groups and, uh, you know, gatherings in people's homes where they're discussing everything from philosophical concepts to uh, the meaning of God. Uh, but it ultimately comes to an end. He finishes his PhD. He goes to Frankfurt where he teaches at an adult education institute. He actually heads it. Uh, and in 1938, though, he is kicked out of the country when the Gestapo round up all the Jews living uh, there and force them to leave the country, uh, which was obviously fortunate that he was able to get out, not that way, but he does get out uh, and ultimately will never go back and uh, in a couple of years ends up in the United States. And what was his family's experience of the Holocaust? Uh, family, very tragic. Uh, his mother and three of his sisters will die uh, in the war and as a result of the Holocaust. Um, and his mother suffers a heart attack uh, when the Nazis come to get her uh, in, in her apartment. Uh, two of his sisters died in Nazi concentration camps, and a third, Esther, was killed uh, in the German bombing of, of Poland. And another sister and brother survive. But this all happens, uh, you know, while, you know, first he's in Europe when his first sister dies, but the rest he's in the United States in Cincinnati and listening to the news and experiencing this horrendous tragedy that, you know, wipes out a large portion of his family. And I don't think any of that will ever escape who he was and the way he thought about the world. Oh, how, how could it? How could it be different? Yeah. Uh, it, it, for for many people today, and for other people who experienced the Holocaust, religion became a conservative force. What are your thoughts about how and why Heschel became committed to social justice as a religious imperative? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I, I start this book by saying it, it's not inevitable that uh, someone like Heschel would end up in the place he was. It wasn't inevitable that his religious convictions or the experience uh, from that war would lead him to a very progressive place, but it does. Part of it, I, I think, is you know his interpretation of what happened. Uh, the horrors of the war. How can you have Nazism? How can you have a nuclear bomb, which was also something that just deeply d disturbed is the wrong word. It's much stronger than that. Um, you know, his answer, and, and he works this out in a lot of the famous books that come out during the 1940s and 50s, is, is we need spirituality and piety in the world to prevent that kind of ugly racism and social injustice. And his interpretation of the Hebrew prophets, which he writes about in his dissertation, will publish as a book in 1962, are these people who were pious and had opened themselves up to the voice of God. And what they heard from God, a God he said had human pathos, love, passion, anger, was outrage about so many of the things that we are indifferent to, so many of the injustices we don't even notice. And they were yelling and screaming at the top of their voices to stop this. And I think as he worked through these books, uh, ultimately, that's what religion was. It was, a, it was a powerful force that could help kind of heal the moral fabric of the world so that the racial injustices and the social injustices didn't happen again. It didn't push him into a conservative place. And ultimately, it would lead him for a whole decade into very serious and ongoing political activism on the ground. 
his writing was also beautiful and lyrical. Uh, the Sabbath is my own personal favorite. Uh, which of his works make the made the greatest impact on American Judaism? Huh. Uh, I, I mean, that's a it's a very uh, it's a hard question to answer because I think there are many, and I think over time it's changed. I mean, the the Sabbath when it came out had a pretty instant impact. It, it is beautifully written. It's a it's a book that helps make sense of one of the most basic Jewish traditions. Uh, articulating why it's important, um, not just theologically, but why it's important in contemporary society in a way I don't think many other people did. And one of the things I learned in my research was uh, not only was the book well-reviewed and, and sold pretty well in the Jewish community, but there's a thing called the Sabbath Project here in 1951 and 52, where um, Jewish organizations are trying to promote Sabbath observance, Shabbat, even in the age of, you know, televisions and suburbs and all of that. And, and the book is the centerpiece of this national campaign. Uh, so it has a pretty big impact at the time. Two books then written around then, Man is Not Alone, which comes out in 1951, and God in Search of Man, which comes out in 1955. I think over time, they will have a really big impact because they put forward his basic thesis, this idea that uh, God needs human beings to make this world better, that uh, God is not uh, some omnipotent force uh, and not a force above us, but actually a, a force that needs to be in dialogue with humans. And the job of humans <laughs> is to um, find this source that he called radical amazement, to get beyond their own ego and to see the wonders of the world and open themselves up uh, to uh, what God is saying. And not everyone will agree with that interpretation, but I think it's a, it's a powerful framework for understanding Judaism and religion altogether. And then finally, the Hebrew prophets, which I referred to, which comes out here in 1962, that has a really big impact, not just with the Jewish community, um, but a lot of civil rights activists at the time read that book because they were very interested in the Hebrew prophets. And that's the book that starts to really uh, bridge Heschel to the world of political activism in the 60s. So uh, it's also a, a landmark piece of work for Jews of that progressive tradition to look back on. So there's a, there's a number of books I would point to. There's others, but that those are some of the big ones. Heschel was concerned about some of the more, I guess we could call them esoteric uh, aspects of religion per se. Uh, for example, the nexus of the sacred and the profane. Uh, did he see a conflict between being good and being holy? Yeah, I mean... Um... That, that is one of the questions that informs uh, a lot of, of his work. And I'm not sure he saw uh, a total conflict. Um, this was something that gets back to that origins question that we're talking about. Uh, how could Auschwitz happen? I mean, uh, for me, that's a question that frames a lot of his thinking and work throughout his life. And he once said, uh, Auschwitz was a manifestation of a world without God. Uh, and and holiness for Heschel was was different than just being a good person. Uh, it involved much more. Uh, it involved a, a total commitment to fulfilling the mitzvot of of Judaism, and it involved an entire mindset about how you approach the world and how you see the people around you. So goodness was was one step in a much bigger project that I think Heschel thought was very uh, important, but also very difficult to fulfill. I mean, he wrote about how modern social science and modern philosophy promoted, not incorrectly, the importance of rationalism, of science, of a totally different framework that he did not reject, but in itself was not enough uh, so that we could find that holiness in the world and find that holiness in ourselves. And holiness being different from moral goodness or ethical exactly. goodness. Exactly. Exactly.
Today, there's a, a great deal of concern, justifiable concern, I believe, about growing anti-Semitism in the United States. Uh, Jews and Jewish institutions are the most frequent targets of hate crimes, despite their very small percentage demographically in the population. Uh, for those of us who are baby boomers, this is a, a new and unfamiliar phenomenon. Uh, we're the first generation to have grown up, I guess, protected by the memories of the Holocaust and the consequences of Judeophobia. Um, but before World War II, there was open, organized hostility to Jews in America. Remind us about Henry Ford, Father Coughlin, and the uh, basically the Jewish American experience of the 1930s. Yeah, so when Heschel arrives here to the United States, he's, he comes in 1940, and he comes after a decade where anti-Semitism during, during the Great Depression, uh, a very difficult era in, in American history, had really flared. And I talk about different elements of anti-Semitism. Uh, Ford, you know, the great automaker, was also a fierce anti-Semite. Uh, he published a newspaper, uh, which was pretty widely circulated uh, in, in the Michigan area that was uh, profoundly uh, anti-Semitic, a symbol of the kind of writing that was not hard to find during that decade. Father Coughlin was a very um, popular, successful talk radio host, essentially, to use kind of modern terms. And increasingly, a lot of what he was saying also was steeped in uh, anti-Semitic tropes. And this was not some small radio show. This was, I, I don't know what the equivalent would be in, in our current times, but one of the most heard uh, radio shows of the time. And there was also just, we, we know um, from uh, the works of, of historians of this period, just lots of anti-Semitism on the street, uh, whether it was the kind of comments Jews would often hear, or in some parts of the country, physical violence uh, often flared. Uh, in the South, it was not uncommon that anti-Semitism and racism went hand in hand. And the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, for example, was deeply invested in both forms of hatred. So uh, it, it's not a story, it, it's different than Europe in that the American Jewish community was really establishing itself. It was not totally marginalized. By the 30s, you start to see figures on the national stage who are Jewish, uh, Irving Berlin, Groucho Marx, uh, Jewish institutions are sprouting up. But that anti-Semitism was very much there. And, and the way uh, Heschel experienced it in part was just a, a subtle um, non-caring in, in the early 1940s or unwillingness to do anything when it was very clear what was happening to Jews in Europe. Well, given figures like Father Coughlin uh, and other uh, clergy of various kinds, and also in Europe, given the uh, accommodation, if not the active uh, enthusiastic participation of uh, many churches with rising Nazism, was Heschel alone in thinking that uh, that the evils of Nazism was a consequence of a consequence of humanity's rejection of the spiritual, it, or were there other religious leaders in other places and that felt the same way? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. There were other religious leaders. He's involved, for example, in Cincinnati. He's very close um, to. Uh, an Orthodox rabbi. He's at the HUC, which is the Reform Seminary at the time. Uh, that's the institution that brings him to the United States as a fellow, part of a program to save European Jews. Uh, and um, he's he's very close to a um, uh, an Orthodox rabbi in um, in Cincinnati, and they have these kinds of conversations about uh, the the lack. The, the absence of religion, the lack of spirituality, and how that connected to 
a world that is able to uh, inflict this kind of of horror. So, so there's certainly other theologians and rabbis who are talking about it. But that's when when I read his work, he articulates it in a very powerful way that I I could imagine is also controversial, um, because he isn't blaming Nazism totally just on Nazis. He's kind of looking at this broader human condition, which in his um, mind had become so weak um, because of the absence of spirituality that it allowed something as horrible as Nazism to take root. Um, and he does this in a series of articles uh, during during the 40s. So he's not alone, um, but I do think he's one who continues to unpack this idea uh, in, in very prominent and articulate ways. Well, since you mentioned HUC and the reform movement, uh, the reform movement thinks of itself as uh, practicing prophetic Judaism. Is that because of Heschel's influence? or No, no I, I would not say that. I mean, um, there's some really great studies of reform Judaism uh, from the you know uh, early 20th century uh, in the United States uh, forward, uh, even earlier, really. Uh, and and this kind of commitment to social justice was already uh, taking hold much broader um, than Heschel. And, and I'm not sure Heschel had that kind of uh, influence uh, at the time on the reform movement. And in fact, uh, Julian Morgenstern, who is the head of HUC, he's the person who has this uh, program to rescue Eastern European Jews. And He's the one who brings Heschel over in 1940, and he's one of the most prominent figures in Reform Judaism. And he himself is an example of how this was already becoming an important part um, of what the Reform movement was trying to do. Stephen Weiss was also uh, a figure very involved in different kinds of political activity. So, so it's and, and Heschel, while he's at HUC, starts to encounter other rabbis. There's a guy. Arnold Kronbach, who's a kind of eccentric rabbi, but he's very committed to these social justice questions and even takes Heschel during the weekends uh, to go outside of Cincinnati to impoverished areas where he spends his Sundays uh, trying to counsel people and provide social services. So uh, Heschel enters into this world during that period. Well, let's talk a little bit about how Heschel was viewed by different groups, by his rabbinic or theological colleagues, both within and outside of Judaism, by um, the membership, the laity, uh, and by the general public. When, when he uh, comes up with the idea or expresses the idea of the theology of a God with emotions, much like human beings, um, I understand that the general public liked it, because it's accessible, but what about his colleagues? And what about the idea also that God had not abandoned humanity in the Holocaust, but rather that people had cut themselves off from God? Yeah, I think there's there's a number of fault lines or points of tension that Heschel will experience really throughout his career, and they change over time. Um, one set of of um, tensions, intellectual, theological tensions revolve around these arguments uh, about God, that God had not abandoned humans, that humans in some ways had not opened themselves up to God, which was a, uh, a, a controversial idea for sure. Um, and that's what I was alluding to earlier, uh, one that, that not everyone was comfortable, certainly at JTS, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, where he moves in 1945, uh, accepting there were differences in his interpretation of God. Not everyone at the seminary uh, believed in God either as uh, having uh, human emotions in the way he described. They were more comfortable with the uh, kind of idea we'll uh, usually associate with Maimonides, a God that was almost more separate from all of us, more above all of us, but not human uh, in in the condition of, of what God was. There were also even bigger tensions, though, uh, in terms of how he was trying to argue Jews should be Jews and what Judaism needed to focus on. And 
uh, when he's at the Jewish Theological Seminary from 1945 onward, there's really big debates taking place at that institution about what should Judaism be about in this post-World War II period, in this era of contemporary uh, times. And uh, the most influential figure will become Mordechai Kaplan, uh, who really is less focused on the kinds of questions Heschel is asking about prayer, about spirituality, and more interested in, in institutions, in the synagogue, as a center of social and cultural life that could ultimately adapt to the experience Americans were having and living and make Judaism relevant uh, through this institution. Uh, you had others like Saul Lieberman, who was one of the giant figures who was much more interested in Jewish law, halacha, and trying to really write books and teach about uh, halacha and the social and uh, historical context of the rabbis who kept interpreting and reinterpreting different pieces of that. So Heschel was kind of an outlier in many ways. He was a throwback. Uh, theology wasn't a focus of what most people were studying. Uh, and his uh, commitment to looking at the individual and the individual's relationship uh, to God was very different, even his lyrical style of writing, than these other two schools that were taking place. And, and Heschel would also find himself in tension with even the students he was teaching, because in many ways, uh, and very openly, he could be quite critical of the rabbinate and what American Judaism was focused on. And in 1953, he gives a speech at the Rabbinical Association Convention, which is in Atlantic City that year at the Breakers Hotel. And he gives a blistering speech about what rabbis are doing. He says they do a lot of things well, and they could give great sermons that sound like op-eds, and they can raise money through testimonial dinners and build beautiful social halls, but they don't teach people how to pray. And he says, modern synagogues have everything, he says, and this is not an exact quote, except life. And he says that the motto of Judaism seems to be monotony and that rabbis don't teach congregants how to pray and they don't teach congregants about these questions that animated his book. And, and that didn't sit well. Uh, didn't sit well with Mordecai Kaplan, who was sitting in the audience listening to this. And it didn't sit well with a lot of young rabbis whose careers would end up in the suburbs of the country working on the kinds of uh, institution building challenges that Kaplan was talking about. So these were all different uh, points of tension uh, that even as he was becoming more popular uh, and more well-known in the country, uh, were very much at play in the institutions and communities that he worked in. And of course, we'll talk about it after, as there were tensions over some of his political positions in the 1960s as well. Well, when I read your book, uh, well, well, Kaplan is kind of more the sociology of religion compared to uh, Heschel. But even when he stays within what we traditionally think of um, as uh, religious or Jewish uh, theology or practice, I, I wondered whether it, his conflict with his colleagues was a kind of reprise of the old conflict between uh, Hasidism and Mignagdim, between the emotional side of Judaism versus the more cerebral, rationalistic at, uh, emphasis on study and practice and not passion. Did, did I, you I, see it that way? I think that's very astute. And I, I think there are ways in which you can look back to Heschel's um, origins in Warsaw and the way he was learning and practicing that uh, Hasidic tradition and understanding why he couldn't sit so easily um, with the dominant approaches that were taking hold at a place like the Jewish Theological Seminary. And interestingly, when he is hired to come to the seminary in 1945 by Louis Finkelstein, uh, who is the new chancellor of the institution, Part of what excites Finkelstein is who Heschel is. He likes that he's emotional and spiritual and in many ways a throwback 
to that world of Eastern Europe that was increasingly foreign to many uh, post-World War II Jews and second-generation Jews whose parents were immigrants, but they were growing up in these new suburbs. And Finkelstein wanted exactly what you're describing to be part of what rabbinic students were exposed to uh, and even faculty were exposed to, but it was at odds. Uh, yes, he was He was not only emotional and in how he thought about how to pray and how he thought about what it meant to do the mitzvot, but even his writing is incredibly uh, emotional. It's poetic. It's literally poetic. Um, he wrote a book, The Earth is the Lord's, uh, which comes out, uh, it's one of his first uh, major books, and it's about this lost world of Ashkenazic Judaism. And if and if you read it, uh, it, it captures the emotion that you're talking about. It sounds much, it reads more like a sermon uh, or a eulogy um, than it does a, a work of social science. But most uh, in JTS were embracing this other tradition or this other approach that you're talking about in the form it was taking in the 40s and 50s. It was to uh, combine uh, social science and, and the approaches social science was putting forward in the universities with studies of Judaism. Uh, and, and that was the mindset. That was even the style of writing. And so that clash manifests itself through some of the tensions that we're discussing. And, and it's more deeply rooted than just post-World War II America. Right. And and if we look at Heschel's ideas and writing through from a 21st century perspective, the theology of amazement uh, could seem <laughs> to the skeptic to be um, a little new agey, a little bit like people say who say they're spiritual but not religious. Awe and wonder and amazement is is kind of a, a nebulous and ambiguous uh, emotion, uh, but but that isn't what Heschel had in mind, was it? No, it wasn't. And uh, a, a, a comparable statement would be that for uh, many Jews in the '60s and '70s, they were very passionate about what today is often called tikkun olam and, and repairing the world, but disconnected from Judaism. Uh, in in both cases, the idea of radical amazement and wonder it was not new agey for Heschel. Although I do think some of the appeal that takes hold of his work after his death is connected uh, to that uh, idea and the popularity of the idea, his was deeply embedded in Judaism, in understanding and studying the Torah, in being literate in Hebrew, in really understanding the mitzvot and practicing as a Jew uh, in a very regular, observant way. All of that was the framework for where he ended up with radical amazement. This was not a secular idea. And and it's just the opposite. He's trying to battle uh, against where secularism in his mind was taking a lot of people. It was disconnected from any notion of God. It was disconnected from any notion of piety. So it would be a big mistake to uh, say this is you know Heschel's version of new ageism. I, I think it was almost the opposite. And uh, that unroots it or disconnects it um, from uh, the basic Jewish tradition that was the foundation for everything he did. Because there are other important um, religious values and attitudes that are not common in general secular life, Western life. Um, humility, uh, loyalty and obedience, uh, reverence, those are all, I think, fundamentally religious values. Does, does that come into play in Heschel's theology, or does uh, radical amazement cover the field? No, radical amazement doesn't cover the field. So uh, if you go back to the Sabbath, it's really uh, an interesting book. Again, it was written in 1951, and he's trying to explain in his words what the Sabbath is, why it's important, and it revolves around this idea of Judaism being a religion um, that sanctifies time and not just territory uh, and physical space. And, and that's the premise of the book. And 
Uh, it's a book about how on the seventh day of rest, uh, we essentially move ourselves out of a framework that's focused on consumerism and work and production, everything, which was a, a dominant national value in early 1950s America, uh, and start to think uh, about the rest of uh, our life and world, not just about radical amazement, but to um, really understand how the most mundane things in some ways, like 24 hours can be holy and can be sacred. And he talked about why uh, Jews uh, pray before they uh, eat and after they eat, uh, the birkat hamazon, uh, they say the motzi over bread. It's a way to really sanctify and think about um, things you often take for granted. Uh, like the food that goes into your mouth. Uh, and so uh, radical amazement was part, I think, of just a bigger canvas of ideas. Um, it was the most powerful of all in my mind, um, but there were many uh, other ideas such as humility and such as appreciation that uh, also inform his writing. And let's not forget that Heschel is also a hero to gerontologists. Uh, Talk a bit about his views on aging. Yeah, he actually um, gives a uh, one of his first U.S. political um, experiences takes place uh, in the early 1960s, where he speaks at a conference uh, on aging um, in Washington, D.C. that was organized by the president. And uh, it's a very political meeting. It's, it's not really a lot of theologians. It's more policymakers. But he gives a, a powerful address about um, the way in which uh, we treat uh, uh, older people and uh, treat people who are in their 60s and above, which in the United States is, is that uh, limit, and uh, really emphasizes that this in some ways is um, a, a test of who we are as a society. And, and he's connecting this to issues like healthcare, which is being proposed at the time, which becomes Medicare in the United States, and puts forward this set of arguments about uh, the elderly, uh, connecting them to his theology and social justice ideas um, that really caught a lot of people's attention at the time. Yeah, it's it's still new today, uh, his, his ideas. Uh, um, finally, Heschel's relationship to Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movements of the 60s is legendary. Uh, American Jews were very actively engaged in that struggle. Two groups who see themselves as descendants of slaves, uh, but but Heschel saw it as a religious imperative, as did MLK, uh, who spoke of the common struggle of blacks and Jews. So reflect with us, please, about why the relationship between the two communities didn't endure. Well. Uh... Uh, so to start with the, the beginning, this becomes a really important relationship to Heschel. Heschel and King first meet in January of 1963 at a conference in Chicago, an interfaith conference that King organizes uh, on religion and race. And he invites Heschel, uh, who he had become familiar with through some third parties. Uh, both of them were um, very interested in the work of Reinhold Niebuhr uh, and Heschel gives a keynote address, which is incredibly powerful, uh, ends with a five-minute standing ovation, which is, it's a very, very strong condemnation of racism in this country. He calls racism Satanism. He argues, Heschel, that anyone who says they are religious isn't religious if they are racist, that the two can't coexist in the same person, and calls on preachers uh, and religious people who are indifferent to this struggle to understand that indifference was not tolerable. And they form a friendship at this conference that will endure. Uh, it will endure for the next few years, culminating with the march in Selma, where the famous photograph is taken uh, as uh, Heschel remains in communication with King and involved in different kinds of civil rights politics. Heschel helps to introduce uh, King to the issue of Soviet Jewry, um, which King will speak about occasionally and understands 
the connection uh, between these two issues. And when Heschel is focused on anti-war activism uh, with the war in Vietnam in the second half of the 60s, it's Heschel who helps to give King a place to make a famous address in 1967 where King comes out against the war and and really changes the anti-war movement because he did this. And so it's an incredibly close relationship and captures not just the personal element, uh, but this marriage of uh, Jewish values and progressive politics. Those tensions will, um, the, the tensions between uh, the civil rights movement and the Jewish community certainly are uh, aggravated by 1968 and 69. There's there's many reasons. Uh, some of it is the aftermath of the 67 war, and uh, there's some in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement who are much more critical of Israel, uh, and and that becomes uh, a fault line uh, between these two communities. There's tensions as uh, the civil rights movement starts to become bolder in uh, what it sees as being necessary to really end racism in this country, including focusing on the North, including focusing on issues like schooling. There's often more tensions um, with the Jewish community, and, and some of the Jewish community is becoming more conservative regardless, and they're starting to move to the right on many questions. So by the end of Heschel's life, um, some of the tensions that will play out over the next few decades are there. Heschel insists they cannot define the relationship between these communities. And uh, even at one moment when there were anti-Semitic remarks made by some civil rights activists in a struggle that took place here in New York, uh, Heschel is, is very clear and uh, strong in his words that these are not things that should separate Jews from the basic cause of civil rights. Uh, look, since then, um, there's been many more tensions, and uh, that's a whole other history. Uh, I think Heschel would be saddened uh, to see that this has happened. In retrospect, do you think he was naive to think that religion and racism were incompatible? Or was it more statements, aspirational statements? I don't think he was naive. I think he really did understand, and this is back to the uh, tensions between the Baal Shem Tov and the Kotzker and how uh, he could understand both had truths in them. I think he he very much understood the power of racism. Uh, some of this was his own ex- – this is a person whose family was wiped out by uh, anti-Semitic racism, so to speak. Uh, and I think he had a very clear eye about what was happening in the United States. In his own uh, diary that he kept when he was in Selma, uh, his account of what he was seeing on the streets, the signs he was seeing um, from uh, the white community that went after both black Americans and Jewish Americans, the rocks he saw thrown at a nun who was marching about three persons to his right, uh, these were all very real. And his activism against the war in Vietnam, not just about racism, but he was profoundly aware of what was happening and the experience of not just U.S. soldiers, but the Vietnamese in what he saw as a total uh, brutal operation that was unnecessary. Uh, he understood, I think, um, uh, not only how deeply rooted some of this social hatred was, but how many people were just totally indifferent to doing anything about it. So he was making a statement. He was sending a message, not unlike King, who in letters for Birmingham jail uh, goes after the moderates in this country and says in some ways they're worse than the racists because they let the racists do the work that they do. Uh, and I think Heschel was pleading. He was crying like the Hebrew prophets for people to listen and for people to awaken from uh, a, a horrible slumber that kept moving us in the wrong direction. And and I'll end by the, the final uh, interview he gives, which I talk about in the book, is on a show called The Eternal Light, which was a show on NBC television that the Louis Finkelstein of the Jewish Theological Seminary had helped to create. And it was to promote Jewish thinkers and ideas and Jewish culture. And 10 days before Heschel dies, um, uh, he gives an interview to a journalist named Carl Stern. And it's a remarkable interview to watch. And Stern keeps basically asking him, how could you be so uh, 
you know, positive? And how could you keep talking about uh, spirituality and finding God when the world seemed to be moving in the exact opposite direction? And uh, Martin Luther King had been assassinated in 68. The war in Vietnam was raging. And Heschel is sad. He's not in a place where he's not aware of all of this. Um, but he argues that the world moves sometimes in a progressive direction, but otherwise in a downward direction, which it was when he was uh, on the verge of, of passing away. But that never stopped him from continuing to share his message, his ideas, his theology. Uh, and, and this was a plea and it had a level of urgency that I think informed all the work he did. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today, Julian. Uh, Abraham for Heschel, Heschel was just a unique and complex man, and your book draws the reader closer to his extraordinary personality. Thank you for sharing it with us today. Thanks for having me. And thanks to our researcher, Bela Pasikoff. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to the Van Leer series on ideas on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform.